Good afternoon. Thank you for that. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning to everyone from wherever you are joining us. This is a, a very important day as we have a conversation about innovation for NTDs in the next decade. We're looking at the critical role of African leadership. And today we have um, a panel and a group of distinguished African leaders, medics, researchers, you know, and people who are authorities in their various fields in public health, in the field of NTDs, who'll be able to take us through this conversation. Um, particularly, uh, I'm particularly interested in NTDs and I'll give just a short story um, of how in my adulthood I came to the realization of NTDs. Um, for those of us who know where Gilgil in Kenya is and its relation to one of the NTDs, that is cutaneous leishmaniasis. I did grow up part of my childhood in Gilgil. And I remember in primary school, we had um, some of my classmates, some of us, my schoolmates with disfigured, you know, uh, faces and some scars on their faces. And I never really quite understood. I thought maybe it's genetic, maybe it's, you know, part of how they've grown up. Then fast forward to 2019, just before, or 2018, just before the pandemic struck and with DNDI, I was covering uh, leishmaniasis. And when we visited Gilgil is when it occurred to me that what in childhood I thought was maybe how my classmates were brought or were, were, uh, were, it turned out that they had actually been victims of cutaneous leishmaniasis. Luckily, I never got to suffer any of those, otherwise I'd be one of the people speaking about my experiences with uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis. And so for me then, it brought the realization that NTDs are actually been here for a long time. And I'm happy to see and to report some of the progress that I see happening. And so if we can have an Africa free of NTDs, then we'll have a generation of, you know, children growing up to adults without working with the scars of some of these NTDs. And that's just one of them. So I'm particularly passionate and um, happy to be a part of the conversations around NTDs. So this day, and as we launch the strategic plan, it's actually quite um, important. Uh, it will chart an eight-year journey about the work of that DND has done on neglected patients and what the journey is going forward for the African continent. So this, for me, is a very critical um, conversation. And I hope uh, that we'll all give our input and we'll all chat our way forward being uh, leaders in our own fields in the various places. For this webinar, I'll just quickly run through who these um, distinguished leaders are. And one of them is Dr. Monique Wasuna. Dr. Asuna is the director for DNDI, that is the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, Africa Regional Office. Monique, welcome. We have Dr. Francis Kuria, who is the acting head of the Directorate of Public Health at the Kenya Ministry of Health, under which the Division of Neglected Tropical Diseases falls, Dr. Karibusana. We have Professor Samuel Karioki, who will be our next uh, one of our panelists, who is the Acting Director General at the Kenya Medical Research Institute, Kemri. Welcome, Dr. We have Dr. Michael Makanga joining us all the way from The Hague. Dr. Makanga is the Executive Director of the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnerships, EDCTP. Welcome, Dr. We have Gerald Chirinda who is the founder and the CEO of Future Africa Investments Limited. Uh, welcome, Gerald. And last but not least, and this is a serious tongue twister for me, Dr. Sheila Shawa, who is a senior programs officer at the African Union Commission in the Department of Social Affairs under the AIDS, TB, malaria, and other infectious diseases division. Welcome everyone to this session. So we look forward to a very interesting one and a half hours where we discuss about NTDs and the innovation in the next decade. Uh, you can be part of this conversation. The hashtag is BitNTDs. 
and Africa Beats NTDs. So you can join us and be part of the conversation. The hashtags are as indicated on your screen, Beat NTDs and hashtag, the other hashtag, Africa NTDs. You can also uh, give your questions on our Q&A box or Q&A option on the Zoom platform. Uh, this would make it easier for us to be able to pick your questions. If you want your question to be specifically targeted to any of our panelists, to any of our speakers, you can indicate that and we'll be able to forward or ask the questions to any of the speakers, any of the panelists during this one and a half hour session. You can also just interact with us on the chat option. We would like to hear what your experiences are, what you have to say about NTDs, and we'll be happy to sample some of those chats and some of those conversations that you have. So we look forward to a very interactive um, one and a half hours of this session. So without um, further ado, allow me to welcome and introduce Dr. Monique Wasuna, who will give us uh, the opening statement to open this session officially. She'll be telling us about um, how the Africa Regional Office consulted its partners in the development of the strategic plan and how this strategic plan will have an impact in the region and the African continent. Uh, Dr. Monique is the director, DNDI, Africa Office. She's a physician and infectious disease and tropical medicine specialist with over 30 years of experience. She's the founding chairperson of LIP. This is the Leishmaniasis East Africa platform, which promotes clinical research and capacity building for this particular neglected and deadly disease. Prior to joining DNDI, Dr. Suna worked at Kemri, the Kenya Medical Research Institute, as a chief research officer. She was also the acting director and chief executive officer. She is also a member of the African Vaccine Delivery Alliance of the African Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So we look forward to hearing from you, Dr. Monique. The floor is yours. Welcome. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Corinne. I will now share my screen. Um, tell me when, if you can see. Not yet. Uh, and now? Uh, not yet, not yet okay. sharing. Now it's now, now, now you've shared. Now you're good. Now you've shared. Yes, okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, please All go right. ahead. So, uh, yeah, so thank you very much, Dr. Corey. And I, I, I wish to join you in welcoming everyone to our webinar on innovation for NTDs in the next decade. Uh, that we will be examining the critical role of African leadership. Uh, this is in relation to our strategic plan. And I have the pleasure of just highlighting uh, some of our strategic plan 2021-2028. Uh, Are you seeing the next slide? Not yet. Okay. Um, I'm sharing. So maybe I ask the team can... to project on their side. Uh, just a moment. You can you can see it. We're still on the opening slide. Okay. Yeah. Um. Sorry about that. We uh. We can just start it again. Remove this. Okay, so the next one. Can you see the next one? Okay, yes, so- Yes, Dr. Ari, I think you can continue now. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. So um, first of all, uh, if you allow me, I can tell you briefly about ourselves. Uh, DNDI is an international non-profit non organization that is um, uh, discovers, develops an uh, affordable uh, and available and adaptable um, treatments for neglected uh, diseases and neglected patients. 
and that's saving really millions of lives. So these are briefly the diseases areas where we work. So over the last 18 years, uh, DNDI has developed nine treatments in six diseases, and, and again, really saving millions of lives. And Africa has a very large uh, collaborative uh, footprint in this. The research and development um, process is not easy at all, and it takes a long time to achieve success. And all the pieces you see here, such as clinical trials, uh, partnerships, um, research networks, are all, are all very, very important. So the strategic plan 2021-2022 uh, development was really a consultative process uh, in the region. We had a total of six meetings uh, with stakeholders in Eastern African region and one internal meeting with staff. The suggestions were, were globally collated and approved by our, our own uh, board of directors. Um, and our CEO, Dr. Bernard Pekul, um, had, uh, had uh, presented this uh, strategic plan globally on the 30th of March, 2021. We in the Africa region here in Nairobi are launching strategic plan again today as a way of really feeding back to the stakeholders who participated uh, in the consultative process and all of you, the stakeholders, the communities, so that we are all again one, you know, uh, part of the process because that process was really, really very rich for us. So briefly, uh, I wouldn't have time to go into the detail, but briefly, this is the overview of our strategic plan 2021-2028. Uh, during this period, we plan to deliver 15 to 18 uh, additional treatments uh, so that by the, the year 2028, we have a total of 25 treatments in 25 years. Our areas of focus will include, uh, will still include neglected diseases, all those uh, areas I've shown you earlier. Um, we'll remain working on them because there are still uh, existing gaps and unmet patient needs. So we will also work on, uh, on pandemic prone diseases such as COVID-19 and others. Uh, and we have new areas of unmet medical needs, including uh, dengue, uh, chistomyosis, and, and, and snake bites. So these are the new areas. Um, we will of course uh, plan to expand access to these treatments as well, because if, we, if, if the target population do not um, receive these treatments, then we shall not make the desired impact. And, 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 and again, Africa will really uh, play a, a, a major role. As you can see, as I said before, clinical trials are not easy. Uh, we want to develop, you know, deliver 15 to 18 additional treatments. That means that you know, we have to increase uh, our clinical trial capacity on average. Uh, on any average year, uh, DNDI is carrying out about 20 active uh, clinical studies, and at least 12 of these are in Africa. But moving forward, I think we need to intend to build more clinical trials and also build capacity to be able to do phase one clinical trials in, in, in Africa. Our strength, our strength is in our partners. And as you, as, as, as you, you already know, we have over 200 partners uh, in Africa. Uh, and, and, and I mean, 200 partners globally, but 65% of these are in Africa. And so we'll try to um, strengthen this uh, because really our strength is in our partners. Uh, we also currently have uh, two uh, networks that are, are led here in the region. And so we will continue to develop this and you know, adapt as the, as the change, changes come. I might just remind you that uh, 1 billion people uh, globally are affected by NTDs and 40% are in Africa and 50% of these are children. So it's important that we include children and other vulnerable populations in our plans to expand the R&D portfolio. And I am really uh, very glad that uh, Gerald is here and will be able to articulate this uh, in his presentations. We also have to move with the times. So new technologies are coming up, such as artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, all this uh, to be able to support innovation of new tools for neglected patients, uh, which we will have to leverage on. In conclusion, we uh, are prominent, uh, 
proponent of um, research for Africans led by Africans uh, working in the low middle income countries and, and having partnerships with other, 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 other people. So Africans must, we must continue to set our own agenda when it comes to research, because I believe that is aware of the shoe that really knows where it pinches. So Dr. Coril, with your permission, I would like just to end by saying that at the end of the webinar, we shall have eight minutes to launch this uh, strategic plan 2021-2028. Um, so I would welcome uh, any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wasuda, for that um, opening remarks. I like uh, what you said, um, research by Africans, and it reminded me of uh, FUBU, for us, by us. So we need our own solutions for our own problems. So thank you very much for bringing that up, and we look forward to the launch of the strategic plan. So next, allow me to welcome Dr. Francis Courier uh, to give his keynote address on really telling us, is it business as usual? What needs to be done to ensure there is country ownership by people and communities collaborating with partners and stakeholders at the center of the entities? And Monique said we have over 200 partners, 65% of these are in Africa. So what needs to be done? Dr. Kuria is the current acting head of the Directorate of Public Health at the Kenya Ministry of Health where the Division of Neglected Tropical Diseases falls. He joined the Ministry of Health in March 2020 from the Kenya Defense Forces on secondment. He has over 29 years of experience in healthcare and healthcare administration, both locally and internationally, including four years that he spent as a medical support officer at the UN headquarters in New York. He leads a dedicated team in the journey towards elimination of NTDs in the midst of the reality of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic in which Dr. Kuria has been a very uh, key uh, part in what the country has been able to achieve in terms of containing the pandemic. So Dr. Kuria, please welcome. Welcome, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Thomas Corin, and my fellow participants and panelists into this very important webinar when we look at the critical role of African leadership in this journey toward the elimination of NTDs and the development of new treatments in the next decade. Well, Kenya, of course, continues to battle a significant burden of neglected tropical diseases, including lymphatic filariasis, so transmitted hermits, cystosomiasis, visceral and cutaneous leishmaniasis, trachoma, tick fever, and kugunya just to mention a few. Must I appreciate that you talk about cutaneous leishmaniasis when you are young. And you notice that as a, my primary career, I am a surgeon, and I encounter a lot of uh, uh, this, uh, what do you call uh, scroto. Uh, enlargements, especially in the coastal region, I work for part of my life, which is part of the wider spectrum of nectar tropical diseases. Of course, in as a country, we are on course with regards to elimination of lymphatic filariasis that I just talked about in all the endemic areas by the end of 2022. And after implementing an excellent campaign over the last six years, preliminary results from the ongoing transmission assessment service indicate that seven out of the 23 endemic implementation units have passed the transmission assessment. And another 11 have already passed the pre-transmission assessment and are now awaiting transmission assessment. The remaining five units will undergo the pre-transmission assessment within the next six months and subsequent to transmission assessment by the end of 2022. Our recognized trachoma program will kick off again its annual mass treatment on the 16th of October this year with a clear goal of achieving elimination in all endemic areas by the end of 2023. More exciting as a country is our ambitious plan to eliminate cystosomiasis and the cell transmitted hermines in all the areas where elimination is feasible from as soon as 2024. We started implementing our innovative Kenya Breaking Transmission Strategy for NTDs 2019 2023 in March this year. And this strategy relies on increased coverage, expanded water, sanitation, 
and hygiene interventions and mainstream behavior change communication as a silver bullet with which uh, immunization will be delivered. In the next round of implementation, which starts in November 2021, we look forward to rapidly scaling up the breaking transfusion implementation from the initial six coastal countries reached in March to 22 countries across the whole country. And the Kenyan Minister of Health is in the process of reviewing the national NTD strategic plan with the primary objective of expanding the elimination target to all NTDs of public health importance in this country. And the new plan will cover the period 2021 to 2025 and will provide for greater dependence on data from surveillance, monitoring, evaluation, and research to inform policy review and information moving forward. The Minister of Health is, of course, committed to the expenditures and elimination of NTDs in Kenya. And this commitment resonates well with the provisions of the WHO NTD roadmap to 2021-2030. African states cannot achieve and sustain elimination with continued reliance on external funding. And transition from external aid is no longer a distant prospect, but a reality. In the recent past, many donors have adjusted the allocation methodologies to encourage transition away from reliance on external sources, especially in countries where the national economy could potentially support a greater share of health funding. Deliberate efforts then must be made to refocus on local funding. And as external financing for Kenya's health program significantly declines, the Ministry of Health has recognized the need to ensure the long-term sustainability of the country's health programs and is in the process of developing a transition load map 22 to 2030, which seeks to strengthen domestic resource mobilization efforts. One key priority in the new roadmap is ensuring access and acknowledging the complex nature of health sector programs. Transition roadmap also seeks to explain how universal health coverage should be sustained for marginalized and vulnerable populations. The rationale for a guided, gradual and progressive transition of course, it's sustainably promote universal health coverage by assuring that even as sources of financing substitute each other, health services will increasingly become more equitable, affordable, and highly high quality services and systems with increased domestic financing. The government of Kenya has prioritized the health sector by making UHC a key development agenda and increasing health sector allocation by approximately 10% since 2019 in line with regional commitments. And the ministry has prioritized the following areas for gradual and progressive transition between 2022 to 2030. Area of essential commodities, service delivery, human resources for health, health information systems, and health infrastructure. And in line with the East African community of states and ministerial commitments for universal health coverage, resource mobilization, decision 2019, the Ministry of Health and the National Treasury should progressively increase the health sector budget by 10% annually between 21 and 2030. The new WHO roadmap, of course, also calls for better integration of NTD care within the national health systems. And African states must move away from the silo approach by strengthening integration of NTD control activities in overall healthcare delivery to optimize utilization of the current available scarce resources for maximum impact. And that means that health workers who are trained in managing NTDs are also looking for and treating other diseases that are prevalent in their regions and enables, and enables this as a patient-centric response. African states, again, which bear the heaviest burden of disease, should start embracing evidence-based approaches to policy review and formulation, as well as continuous improvement of implementation efforts. You are aware that Kenya has been host to several research projects which have resulted in more effective interventions against NTDs. The paromycin sodium stivoglucone combination study has been the duration, has seen the duration of management of visceral responses reduced from 30 to 17 days. And this has significantly reduced untoward effects, improved outcomes, and increased compliance to treatment. We are proud to be associated with the game-changing research work, which was hosted here and conducted by DNDI. I wish to conclude here. Dr. Masse, my fellow panelist, by wishing you a productive webinar from which cutting edge insights will emerge to further accelerate entity elimination efforts. I thank you all for your attention and may God bless you. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kuria, for that. I'm happy to hear that um, about, especially about integrating NTDs into the system so that um, we stop handling them from a silo perspective. And hopefully uh, this is something that the panelists and the participants uh, see as one of the key things in being able to manage NTDs. And as you said, the healthcare workers trade in NTDs are able to also identify other diseases, not just NTDs. And I think the prioritization of health uh, in Kenya and hopefully other African countries is seen as a key you know, cog to the development of the country. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kuria, for your keynote address. Thank you, our participants. I can see you've started putting your questions on the Q&A uh, option or chat box on the Zoom. Uh, our host and some of our panelists will be able to answer some of those questions, but we'll take some of the Q&A questions, some of the questions at the end of this first plenary. So I'd like to encourage all of you to continue just posting your questions and we'll be able to answer them. The hashtag in which to uh, participate in this conversation is beat NTDs or Africa beats NTDs. Beat NTDs, Africa beat NTDs. So we'll quickly go into a first plenary discussion with our four panelists. Allow me to introduce them. Uh, the first one is Professor Samuel Karioki, who is the Acting Director General at, at Kemri. He's a fellow African Academy of Sciences and an honorary faculty at Welcome Sanja Institute. He is a visiting professor of tropical microbiology at Nafield Department of Medicine, University of Oxford, UK, and a member of the American Society for Microbiology. He has served in other esteemed positions uh, like being the chair of GAP, Kenya, that's the Global Antimicrobial Resistance Partnership. Until his appointment as the Acting Director General of Kemri, he was the Director in Charge of Research and Development. Uh, welcome, Professor Sam Kariuki, you can see him there. Then we have Dr. Michael Makanga, who's the Executive Director of the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership. He's a clinician scientist with 27 years of professional experience in health and poverty-related infectious diseases in Africa. Before his current role, Dr. Makanga was first in clinical practice and academia, and later clinical research and research management. He has served in various scientific and policy advisory boards for international product development, philanthropic organizations, the World Bank, pharmaceutical companies are involved in developing medicinal products for poverty-related and neglected diseases. Welcome, Dr. Makanga. We have Gerald Chirinda, who is the founder and CEO of Future Africa Investments Limited. Um, he is the founder of Youth Combating NTDs, which is a global community of young people who are fighting to end NTDs. And we are happy that we have youth taking a critical role of leadership in NTDs. Um, this is an initiative of Future Africa Forum, uniting to combat NTDs. He's also the co-founder of Educate, which is an education access and improvement company. He's the founder of Future African Forum. As the founder of Africa Future Forum, he engages leaders, governments to advance Africa's prosperity. He's a BMW Foundation responsible leader and an alumni of the Global Shapers community. Uh, Gerald Churinda, Please welcome. And then last but not least is Dr. Sheila Tamara Shawa, who is a senior programs officer at the AU Commission in the Department of Social Affairs and AIDS, TB, malaria, and other infectious diseases. She is a focal person for TB, NTDs, and the Community Health Workers Initiative. Dr. Shawa is an experienced researcher with a demonstrated history of working in the research and public sector and has vast expertise in coordination of infectious disease prevention and control initiatives at country level and implementing these strategies at a regional and continental level through policy and advocacy. So all my panelists, please feel welcome. And so we'll quickly get to the conversation of this first part of the plenary. And I'd like to start with uh, Professor Karioki. What are the existing challenges that African scientists face that could impede research and innovation for new NTD tools and adoption of technologies to improve the health of neglected patients. Uh, 
uh, uh, Prof, Prof, you're still on mute. If you could uh, kindly unmute uh, so that we could hear you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Masikoril, and apologies for that. And uh, very, very nice to have you here. Uh, have me here, and uh, really, really very, very pleased to be able to discuss this. Um, one of the key issues around NTDs, and uh, really the way we need to uh, respond to the emergency of uh, NTDs, because I call them emergencies, because they are truly emergencies, is one uh, ownership. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Kimani uh, alluded to this in his uh, keynote address, uh, that our government, uh, especially our own government here, is doing the best they can, of course, to be able to prioritize NTDs as a public health emergency in many ways, so that we are able to respond adequately with um, uh, adequate funding and also uh, resources, other resources, including uh, prioritizing that for research. Uh, I'm glad the NDI is doing their best, but still, if you look at also other issues like um, the hard to reach populations, which are most afflicted by NTDs, have we done enough to be able to reach these people and be able to know what really is uh, delivering their, their, you know, their public health uh, underlying issues to access uh, first for diagnostics and also for management of uh, their various NTD uh, challenges. The other challenge I am, I've been looking at and which uh, really uh, needs to be addressed is the issue of the silo mentality uh, of the different entities, individuals, organizations that work on NTDs. And are we, doing, are we doing enough to be able to, to work together in uh, collaborations, uh, in partnerships, to be able to really uh, face NTDs as, as a single problem that affects all of us in a manner that we can bring together resources and share our experiences in uh, under one uh, kind of uh, forum? Let me also uh, mention briefly re regarding, of course, uh, the lack in Africa specifically of a critical mass of researchers interested in NTDs. We find that uh, those that are within this uh, area of influence, most of them probably end up there because they found an opportunity through funding or an opportunity through probably as they climbed up their ladder through uh, probably academic exposure. Uh, but have we been able to train enough people to work on NTDs? particularly in the area of uh, new technologies for uh, detection and diagnosis for epidemiological and ecological mapping of NTDs. And uh, much more important, of course, are uh, new tools and uh, new products uh, for management and uh, control of NTDs. These are some of the areas that I thought we need to address in the area of uh, response to NTDs. Um, thank you, Prof. And I think uh, you echo some of the things that uh, Dr. Kuria talked about. And we'll get to hear, I think, uh, some of the proposed solutions from this panelist. But allow me to ask uh, Dr. Makanga, you have worked with various stakeholders over the last 27 years. You have, you know, uh, a good experience in the different fields and having interacted with the different stakeholders. What are some of the challenges that these this stakeholders face in financing innovation for entities in Africa and possibly some of the solutions that you think uh, would work in this space? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Karin. And, uh... Greetings to all that are connected on this webinar. Uh, this is um, a big area. I'll just focus on four quick uh, challenges. And usually in challenges are also enveloped opportunities. First is uh, looking at the source and availability of the needed research inputs that are required to combat the problem of neglected tropical diseases. This is an area where there are limited uh, researchers and product developers that are involved. And even those that have trained, they tend to move to other areas that are more uh, recreative in a sense. Of course, the infrastructure and the funding, having funding that is sustainable and that can be scalable. And this is putting it in the context of uh, three different, three levels of research here, because we have the basic and uh, early research that involves discovery and the preclinical. You have different organizations that are interested in this space. 
majorly because this is an area that requires more risk. And you tend to find more funding going to this coming from public uh, funding from high income countries and also philanthropic organizations, majorly the Wellcome Trust and the Gates Foundation plus other foundations. But there's very limited contribution that is coming from the low and middle income countries here. Secondly, incentives for participation, especially when it comes to the second level of product development going beyond the basic research and the preclinical research, taking this in clinical and uh, clinical development. This requires the involvement of multinational organizations, pharmaceutical organizations, then they, they need to be incentivized. And this requires mitigating costs and also reducing the risk on research and development. They rely heavily on public funding to do the de-risking and also the philanthropic organizations. And here, entities have to do a lot to motivate for this. Thirdly, research paradigm and focus. Here, uh, this is where entities need to do more to really map out the priorities. The diseases are many, and the priorities to be well articulated to the funders, linking the linkage to the problem to the benefit of supporting research in this area. This is poorly articulated with NTDs. And lastly, the ability to generate actual innovation and to make it available to the patients. Now, often we have different funders focusing on different areas, but having that end-to-end -end thinking, making sure that the products that are developed are made available to the people that need them most, requires focus also on the post-registration space, looking both at the product and also the delivery mechanisms, evaluating this in the post-registration effectiveness studies and implementation research that is relevant to the context where this work is done. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Makang. And I can see there's a question that I think would be, I should ask you, but let me, let's hear from Shirinda first, and then we'll come to that particular question. For Gerald, we always told, you know, the, the youth are the future of Africa. The youth are the future of um, the continent. How have NTDs affected the youth, especially in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you very much uh, for the question, Dr. Mercy, and uh, thank you to DNDI for, for having me. And uh, you know, to answer your question, uh, entities have affected youth uh, in the wake of COVID-19. I would say maybe specifically in two ways, um, you know, because young people are the majority in most societies, you know, which are high burden, where, where we have a high burden of diseases. Uh, that means that they're also the highest at risk. And I mean, as you mentioned, Dr. Mercy, you witnessed this firsthand growing up in, in, in Gilgil. And, uh, you know, the first area uh, is that access to drugs uh, has possibly been reduced or limited due to the COVID-19, as a lot of, you know, young people get access to NTD treatments through MDAs at schools, um, et cetera. And we know that most schools have been closed and, you know, gatherings banned in order to curtail the spread of NTDs. And, uh, you know, also whilst still on access, the, the, the recent uh, 150 million pound aid cuts towards NTDs by the UK government is also set to reduce access significantly with millions of young people uh, from across, I think it's 26 African countries uh, who should have been receiving treatment, unfortunately not probably receiving that treatment uh, between the period of 2021 to 2022 if those uh, budget cut remains. Now, this obviously requires our governments in Africa to quickly cover that gap and to provide domestic uh, funding from their treasuries for, for, for this and also for research and development. Um, the second way in which NTDs have affected youth in the wake of COVID-19, in our opinion, is through a possible increase uh, in mental health issues. Now, NTDs are associated obviously with a lot of stigma and discrimination, and uh, COVID-19 has also brought with it uh, lockdowns and self-isolation, which obviously lead to loneliness and anxiety, you know, as a result of uncertainties. And we 
excuse me, we are of the opinion that COVID-19 has exacerbated the double burden of NTDs and mental health in vulnerable communities. And this is an area that is relatively underexplored. And uh, I think it is important uh, if more efforts and resources are directed towards this. And, you know, NTDs mainly affect hard to reach populations as earlier mentioned. And these are people who lack access to basic healthcare services, which means that most of the mental health issues uh, that are faced by young people suffering from NTDs will probably go undiagnosed and underreported. So I think these are two specific areas, um, you know, where young people have been affected, um, you know, uh, by NTDs in the wake of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, um, Gerald. And to wrap up this first part of the plenary is um, Dr. Sheila Shower. Uh, uh, Dr. we'd like you to give us an overview of the continental framework on NTDs and how they support the full integration of interventions towards the control of NTDs and how it promotes the harmonization of community-based initiatives and ownerships, given that you, you, know, you have a continental continent-wide view of NTDs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, to just highlight uh, the continental framework on NTDs. I think from our, um, uh, our angle or from the commission, this is the first time that we're actually putting in a strategic framework uh, that provides some guidance, some policy guidelines on how to address NTDs on the continent. And so in, in just um, a nutshell, a, um, the continental framework is designed to provide some guidance to the African Union member states in response to the fight against NTDs on the continent. So the document was developed in collaboration with experts from member states working as NTD managers or senior official in the NTD program. And these experts came through to Addis Ababa and were able to sit down and come up with this document. So the framework is in line with our agenda 2063, uh, the Africa we want. I think um, most of you have heard about it, which is really a strategic, it, it's our objective as a commission and as a continent to uh, just highlight where we want to see Africa in the next um, 50 years. So the development of the agenda 2063 brought about the revitalization of frameworks with much shorter lifespan for the implementation and um, control um, of um, other diseases as well, apart from NTDs, uh, in a cascaded manner to ensure that the objectives of having a healthy and well, uh, of having healthy and well nourished citizens um, is achieved. And so our frameworks are actually either in um, a cut down to 10 years implementation, or we have them as 15 years implementation uh, period, because we know that we cannot, you know, for us to reach the um, 50 years target, we have to start implementing um, in a cascaded manner in, in, in shorter lifespans. So among us, um, the frameworks that we've developed is the Africa Health Strategy. Uh, most of you could be aware of it, which is really an over document that provides strategic guidance on all health matters um, uh, on the continent to ensure that these are implemented uh, by our member states to reduce mobility and end uh, preventable mortality uh, uh, from communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases. Um, and in this uh, 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 strategic plan, we have the NTDs included, and the aim is to ensure that um, NTDs, uh, we end NTDs as a continent by the year 2030. Um, so uh, you also notice that the, the, the targets of the continental framework are in line with the, um, the um, SDGs, but also when we're developing this document, we worked closely with our colleagues in WHO, both Afro and EMRO, to ensure that there was alignment in the message that we're taking to member states, and also that we're on the same page when it came to the control of entities. So basically, the vision of the continental framework is to, is, is to free Africa of all entities by the year 2030 and the mission is really to strive towards the integration of strategies and efforts deployed by africa to control and eliminate entities and Dr. Sheila, I think your network is uh, shaky. The science approach to NT.
entities. And so we are, I mean, uh, drug is integration. Um, and also. Okay, um, Dr. Sheila's network seems to be shaky. I think we'll come back to her. Um, I think uh, the technical team will just uh, align that and then we'll come back to Dr. Ali to finish her comments. Uh, let me just pick a few questions from the Q&A before we get to a second part of the Okay, I hope we are not experiencing any technical challenges. Um, I'd like to pick the first question for Dr. Makanga, and this is on funding really. And uh, this is from Innocent, who's saying that one of the key issues in R&D is awareness and funding, resource mobilization, at the request side. How do you think this issue can be addressed in Africa where most of the research is externally led? Dr. Makanga. Thank you very much. Um, I have to say that this is uh, a very dynamic environment because uh, one, it depends on the category of research and the funding providers for this. I'll be speaking to this when we talk about the funding landscape broadly, uh, when I get an opportunity to speak to this. But one of the things, uh, if I may speak now from the perspective of my organization, is where we've been trying to ensure that the African researchers take the lead uh, in developing the research questions that are relevant to their local settings while promoting international collaboration. So this is something that has to be ingrained in the researchers right from the, at the national level to grow researchers that will be able to address questions that are pertinent to the national setting. So that is something that has to be done from the national level, but also with contribution from outside. And of course, uh, I'll talk more about the research landscape and how funding can be accessed. Over. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Tari. We'll come back to that. This next one, I think, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Kuria and Dr. Matendachero, who are in this meeting. And um, the question is what strategies are developed to monitor the quality of services to achieve the goal of NTDs? freeing and freeing the continent of entities since quality is a big issue and a rider to that somebody is asking when is the leishmaniasis campaign beginning it's 16th is it 16th of october or 16th of november uh dr kuria or dr batendechero the floor is yours Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Korir. I was uh, waiting to see if uh, Dr. Kuria wanted to say anything, but uh, maybe I can just go first. Uh, uh, so uh, I will, uh, first of all, I'll dispense with the issue of uh, the campaign that's starting on the 16th of, uh, of, of October. Uh, this one, uh, from what the director said, is uh, with regard to trachoma you realize that we have been reorganizing our trachoma program in country and now we are setting out to be able to implement it consistently and effectively with the, the kind of coverage that we need we have been implementing trachoma interventions in the past but uh, the effectiveness has not allowed us to be able to achieve the goals as fast as we wanted to and that's why we are very optimistic that when we relaunch uh, on the 16th of October, uh, when we now, uh, you know, uh, resume our, our mass drug administration, then we will be able to meet the target of elimination by 2023. So I just wanted to clarify that. For leishmaniasis, it's an ongoing uh, passive and active surveillance, uh, no campaigns. We actually just have ongoing training and treatment in our facilities. Now, with regard to quality, this is an ongoing thing. We, we conduct it all the time. Uh, first of all, uh, in the mass 
campaigns, mass treatment campaigns, we use only quality assured medicines, which are donated, uh, you know, most of them thankfully are donated by WHO. But over and above that, as a country, we have gone out to seek uh, additional uh, donations from the manufacturers, and we really want to appreciate uh, Mark for being able to give us all the quantities of praziquantel that we need for schistosomiasis. When it comes to, you know, uh, the soil transmitted helminths, uh, Johnson & Johnson has come through and giving us all the donations that we need uh, for the adults and the children. So high quality medicines which have been pre-qualified by WHO and we try to make sure that whatever we give during our mass campaign are quality assured uh, products uh, that do not give us any problems. Then over and above that, we work very closely with the Pharmacy and Poisons Board in Kenya, uh, which has become part of our technical working group so that we conduct pharmacovigilance and close monitoring so that if there are any effects that uh, are seen, any poor medicinal quality, you know, poor quality medicinal products, we are able to pick them up within a very short time and to be able to correct the situation. So quality for us is paramount. It is high on the list. It is something that we watch every day. Thank you. And this, uh, uh, probably I want to hand it over to Dr. Kuria in case there's an additional comment from his side. Thank you. And back to you. Okay. Thank you, Sultani. I think I'll take uh, Dr. Kuria after this next question um, that I'll come back to Dr. Ari for him to wrap up. Um, this one I want to ask uh, Dr. Monique. Um, this is from Aziza. Based on For Africa by Africa, this was in your presentation. Uh, he's wondering how does DNDI's role in innovation affect local R&D as DNDI is predominantly a European organization? Does this take away a purely local research possible in the African region? Thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, maybe I'll start by saying that uh, as DNDI, we are uh, we are found in, in Latin America, in, in Africa here, we are in um, Kinshasa, in DRC Congo, we are in South Africa, in um, uh, Cape Town, and here in Kenya, in Nairobi. So those are the offices that are here. And we work in India, in Kuala Lumpur, and uh, Japan, and so on. So um, the African agenda is, uh, is key. And, and as you can see, I'm an African. Our headquarters is in Geneva, but we have Africa regional African offices in, in Africa, taking care of the patient needs and uh, also uh, ensuring that we work with the ministries of health and whatever we do is in line with what the country wants, what the needs are. We just don't, it just doesn't drop from the air. So there's a lot of consultation um, uh, that, that goes on. And definitely uh, we encourage the, the principal investigators for all the projects. Um, you know, in Africa to be Africans, because we are also building capacity for Africans to be able to do clinical trials. Uh, we cannot remain Spana boys, Spana girls for a long time, do this and do the other. We want them to lead and, 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 and be responsible and take care of the, 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 the study participants in uh, according to international guidelines. So that capacity is being built uh, by DNDI and actually the data that we are collecting is credible uh, because uh, we've been even audited by uh, 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 FDA for example and you know our data is credible and uh, we work as um, Matende Chero says with the pharmacy and poisons boards here in Kenya and other regulatory authorities all over and to ensure that the research that we do is credible. So yes Africa for Africans we we have to because as I said the wearer of the shoe knows where it hurts and so, yeah, yeah, it is true, it's real. I am a living example. I have been, um, a while I was at Camry and I, and, and, and you know, uh, working, doing projects for DNDI, I was the principal investigator of the project that we are doing in uh, Kimalel, uh, in Kacheliba, I'm the PI. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can see a face to the, um, to your question. So it is true. And we have countries like Sudan, Ethiopia, Uganda, where they're all principal investigators and the Africans. 
Okay. Thank you, Dr. Asuna, for that uh, your assurance. Uh, Aziza, I hope uh, Dr. Monique has answered your question. I think I will quickly run through um, the next section and then we come back to the Q&D and we'll give uh, the panelists a chance to respond to some of the questions and to wrap up on some of the issues. Uh, I don't know if we have uh, Dr. Shawa back, uh, Sheila. Hello, is this better? Okay. Okay, now, now you are okay, now you're good. I wanted to ask you on this uh, second part, the place of innovation within the continental framework on NTDs in helping to eliminate NTDs by 2030 as you um, conclude your previous conversation. I know we had to stop you halfway. Okay, thank you so much. So allow me not to uh, switch on my video just to improve on the connectivity. I hope that's fine, right? Yes, yes, that's okay. Please go ahead. Okay. So anyway, I just wanted to just, I, I don't know where I left off, but I think I can just highlight the objectives of the, of, of the continental framework and then just move on to uh, explain the place of innovation in the continental framework, if that's okay. That's okay for about three minutes. That should be okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So anyway, so the, the, the key objectives of the continental framework are first of all, uh, the need to fully integrate interventions into, through a multi-sectorial approach. And um, what we are calling for in the continental framework is that there's need to, in, uh, to advocate that these interventions, um, 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 uh, including um, water and sanitation, good hygiene practices, health education, vector control, uh, veterinary public health, uh, preventive chemotherapy, innovative and you know, uh, you know, uh, intensified disease management are fully integrated into the programs mm -hmm. and there's a multi-sectoral approach in implementing them. And we're also calling for the harmonization of community-based in, in, in innovations through engaging the, the communities themselves to ensure and encourage ownership um, when implementing uh, control and elimination um, interventions. We are also calling for the increased establishment um, of uh, fully functional NTD uh, control programs. And this is because we know that not all countries are fully functional programs. And sometimes these uh, programs are, are siloed depending on the, on the disease. So we're calling for um, a functional um, uh, NTD program that is inclusive of all um, the diseases. Uh, and the fourth and um, final one is the need for enhanced coordination at a national level. We understand that NTDs have to be mainstreamed into other uh, programs. We also know that um, no line, no one line ministry can achieve the goal of uh, controlling and eliminating NTDs. And um, so there's need to ensure that um, all uh, ministries involved uh, actually align and they work together. They collaborate on the interventions uh, in, uh, on the control and elimination of NTDs. We're also calling for domestic financing because we did a survey um, uh, last year. And from our survey from about 40 member states, one thing that came out uh, clearly, and I've heard the panelists speak about them, is the lack of financing. So you find that most of the NTD programs are donor funded. Um, the local government or uh, the national programs themselves do not have a budget line. And so for implementation of basic um, intervention, such as the wash, health education, health promotion, those cannot be undertaken because there's no financing for even operations. So the core is to ensure that governments allocate a minimum amount, even just for operations to, to the functioning of um, uh, 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 NTD programs. And then to respond to um, the place for innovation, um, uh, with um, NT, uh, the place for innovation in the continental framework. So um, one of the strategic approaches that we have highlighted is, um, is to advocate for research development and innovative technologies. We do note that while there has been tremendous um, advancement in terms of diagnosis and treatment options for um, other diseases, 
um, NTDs have lagged behind in these initiatives. And so you find that ancient, uh, ancient technologies are still used um, in diagnosis and treatment of NTDs. So there's need to intensify the advocacy um, at political level, at regional and national level to ensure that there's sustainable financing towards the development of new technologies in the treatment and diagnosis of NTDs. We also, um, there's also need, okay. there's also right, need uh, to ensure, you can... mm -hmm. okay. There's also need to ensure the prioritization um, at country level where uh, stakeholders start advocating together with us for increased financing towards research and development um, of, NTD, of the NTD agenda. And so we're also urging our member states to create an enabling environment because sometimes the financing for um, uh, research is there and people are willing to actually provide um, some funding towards research or, or technical assistance, but you find that the environment does not promote it in countries. So countries, um, it's a call for them to provide that enabling environment for research and uh, development. Okay. And also, you know, in addition to the you... continental framework, we have okay, a uh, common African position. If you could, uh, you actually look through. Dr. Shai, could you just summarize? Because we are running short of time, you could just summarize uh, in the next half a minute or so. Okay, so I think that was the last point to say. We have developed a common African position where these aspects are being highlighted, which is like a stance that the African continent has taken on NTDs. And we've actually given um, the regional committees, the partners, we've actually recommended some of the steps that they can um, undertake to assist us in ensuring that we reach the target of, the, of controlling and eliminating NTDs by the year 2030. Over. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I think you have really um, emphasized on the bit about funding and need for domestic funding, and I'm sure we'll get to hear this from the rest of the panelists also. Uh, Professor Karioke, I'd like to come to you next about um, what strategies Kemri has put in place to build the capacity of African scientists so that they can carry out research and development for new and innovative NTD tools. And on the q and I could see uh, some questions relating to capacity building in some of the institutions about training and the lack of training in some of the institutions. Some young researchers are wondering what would be key research questions. So if you could just tell us about uh, capacity building. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and um, Dr. Basi, you've uh, mentioned something very, very important about building capacity for uh, purposes of uh, uh, investigating and uh, doing enough research on NTDs. At Cambry, one of the things we've done, and this is going back to now about uh, eight years, is to have a very, very strong program on infectious and parasitic diseases program that really focuses not just on the conventional uh, infections and uh, parasitic uh, syndromes. And, uh, and uh, we are doing that very, very deliberately to be able to target some of these neglected tropical diseases. Um, we at Cambry are also a center of excellence in training in uh, control and prevention of uh, some of the most common endemic uh, parasitic infections. Uh, we currently are involved in um, a school-based uh, deworming program, for instance. Uh, but apart from that, we, uh, as you know, have led research into uh, uh, eradication and elimination, finally, of uh, uh, filariasis in, in the country and the region. We led in other initiatives, looking at schistosomiasis and other um, uh, very, very important um, uh, neglected tropical diseases. Uh, we are also at the cutting edge in terms of uh, ensuring that our scientists have uh, the appropriate technologies, including whole genome sequencing, uh, to be able to do hotspot mapping of where we have uh, uh, some of these areas where NTDs are endemic. And uh, we are very, very fortunate also working with the Ministry of Health because uh, in the last three years, we have uh, obtained more funding now targeted towards infectious diseases, but much more so uh, with regard to training in areas of uh, NTDs. 
uh, our graduate school, which is uh, currently seeking uh, further um, autonomy in uh, obtaining a charter for training in specialized uh, research areas, uh, is also looking at emphasis in some of these areas where we want to really encourage master students, PhD students to take up uh, these programs that train specifically on infectious diseases and parasitic infections, but also look at NTDs. We are looking also at uh, uh, generally the issue of dissemination and translation of research findings. We can do very, very beautiful work in the uh, area of uh, research on NTDs, but if we do not have the right for, uh, for dissemination of our out, outputs, then we don't go far enough to reach the stakeholders, to reach the policymakers. And that we are doing by engaging the Ministry of Health uh, through policy briefs. And I can assure you, uh, we have been able to provide this through some of the programs that we run, including the, the, the school-based uh, programs and also uh, the programs on uh, elimination of some of these NTDs. So those are some of the areas that we are focusing on with regard to uh, capacity building for uh, not just Cambria, but the other country. Thank you, thank you, Prof. And um, I can confirm that I've seen some of those policy briefs well articulated and they're usually even easy to uh, interact with and synthesize some of the information, even for the lay public. So thank you, Prof, for that, uh, the good work that you're doing. Allow me next to ask uh, Chirinda uh, from a youth perspective. Are there any examples where youth are combating NTDs and how can the African youth contribute to the fight against NTDs, especially in supporting innovative initiatives? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Messi, for your question. And I think there's a there's a lot that young people can contribute. Um, you know, but I, I'll, I'll just base this on some examples based on our experience. Um, the first thing really is creativity. You know, young people play a key role in providing awareness on NTDs, in providing awareness on basic treatment, on prevention measures, and available health programs. This can be done creatively and in ways which you know other people can can understand. So a most recent example uh, is the World NTD Day Storytelling Competition that uh, we held. We saw interest coming from you know, close to a thousand young people. And this proved that they, they too are interested you know, in such important issues. Uh, in fact, our judges had a very difficult task of coming up with uh, you know, just 40 finalists uh, who made it into our virtual art gallery. And uh, you know, finally, we had 15 prize winners uh, as opposed to 12 that we initially envisioned. That's how good the quality uh, you know, of creative material that these young people came up with. The second area really is innovation. I think you know, our generation is a very tech savvy, tech driven generation. And uh, you also have a lot of innovators amongst young people. Um, you know, and, and they need to be able to harness that ingenuity and uh, that innovation capability uh, across the value chains of NTDs. Now, we have examples within our, our network, our youth network. And, uh, um, you know, I'll give you a, a, an example of two young ladies who are based in Tanzania who run an organization called uh, Mobile Afia. And uh, they use their platform to communicate health related issues, um, you know, to, to their communities and using uh, mobile phones and also in, in, in their local languages. So we have also seen several cross sectoral innovations, uh, say within the WASH space. Uh, one of the things that we've been responsible for is engaging innovators that we have found in other spaces to actually say, you know, part of your innovations are actually effective in eliminating neglected tropical diseases. And, um, you know, we have seen that that is also an awareness angle for us as an organization. I mean, we have young champions who are also working in last mile delivery uh, using drones uh, for other issues, but this could easily be used for NTDs as well. So, so, so there's a lot that young people can do. And I think the last thing really is, is organizing and engagement, you know, for, for some of these ideas to actually make it over the line, because we are transitioning from places where we, 
used to do things manually to places where we are relying a lot on technology, it requires political buy-in. So, so we you know, are forming groups uh, to put political pressure uh, and engage with, with uh, you know, local, national, as well as regional leaders you know, uh, on commitments uh, made by governments and also on what we think should be the direction that uh, you know, governments should be going and implement us within the, the NTD space. But you know, lastly, for all of this mm -hmm. to be successful, you know, it is important that we, um, you know, uh, get financial investment and support coming from the NTD community itself. You know, the activities that I've mentioned to you that we have done in the past okay. and some that we require to do in the future, uh, you know, require resources. And my hope is that, you know, organizations such as DNDI, as they roll out their strategy from now until 2028, um, you know, have youth playing a central role in its delivery and its execution. And that financial investment also goes uh, and is made towards this effort. So, you know, the success and failure uh, of youth engagement is also hinged on the level mm -hmm. of support by stakeholders within this particular space. And, um, you know, we understand that, um, uh, uh, you know, many organizations don't know how to engage young people, but this is why we exist and, you know, our mm -hmm. doors remain open to engaging organizations and seeing how young people can, uh, you know, play uh, 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 mm -hmm. an, an added okay. part uh, in the elimination of these diseases. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the running theme has actually been on resource and support uh, for all of these programs, for all the stakeholders and the people who are key in participating in this. So because of this, I'd like to wind up this part with Dr. Makanga about um, what the funding landscape for innovation of for innovation for entities looks like in the future and what role the African leaders can play in this. What do you see as your organization's uh, contribution in this? And from the chat, there have been questions about, will there be opportunities for funding in the year 2022 to 2025? What are the opportunities for partnering with the regulatory authorities in handling NTDs? So basically, how can people navigate this, you know, filled with partners, with funding, and you know, being able to play their part in eliminating entities, Dr. Terry. Thank you very much. I'll try to um, put this together, starting with the investment landscape and the way that I see this evolve. Um, first of all, to look at it from the three uh, levels, basic early stage research, uh, this is majorly uh, when you look at basic research discovery and preclinical development. It's majorly funded uh, from uh, on the side of public funding from high income countries and from philanthropic organizations. And when industry are involved, it is mainly in house development. Now, this funding is of two types. From the high income countries, they have their intramural and then extramural. On the African side, we benefit from the extramural funding, and that is usually competitive. So that requires a good competitive base for excellence on the side of science. Secondly, going to the second level, clinical and field development, and also the registration and post-registration studies. Now, this is research that is increasingly being de-risked with funding from public sector and the philanthropic organizations. And this is where the multinational pharmaceutical companies come in. But as you know, uh, diseases uh, that are related to NTDs do not really generate much profit for, for these multi companies. So they are really doing it as part of social responsibility. In that case, uh, a lot of work has to be done by organizations such as DNDI, bringing together researchers and product developers to take this forward and to help work with uh, institutions in Africa to promote the development. Then moving on to the next level, and that is the post-registration space. Funding for that uh, to do effectiveness studies. These are studies in the real life environment and also operational research linking it to health systems. This work really requires a lot of collaboration with the host countries, much as the others do. But this is where you're integrating the research with the national health systems and making sure 
that the products reach the people that really need them. Now, this requires investment in, um, of, on the side of the government to ensure that uh, there is some support that goes on to bring in the social determinants of health so that these are evaluated well along with the work. Secondly, this is where the integration with other diseases come in so that the implementation of these interventions is done in a very collaborative way with other diseases. And not to forget, these studies depend a lot on good epidemiological research and also good health and, dem and demographic surveillance systems. And these are areas where the countries can co-invest. Now, how does this look like when you look at the pre-COVID and the post-COVID space? There was a longer shift in the pattern of product funding towards drugs, vector, uh, vector product, control products and diagnostics, and less on vaccines uh, and basic research pre-COVID. But what is happening now is that post, during this time of COVID, you are having emerging technologies and platforms that are heavily skewed towards prevention rather than cure. So there is a need to have that balance looking for going forward that there will be funding to take care of developing of interventions for cure, for prevention and for diagnosis and also linking this together uh, with other diseases. Um, how does uh, my organization do uh, come in here? Uh, EDCTP is mainly supporting clinical development and more focus is now going towards late stage development of clinical interventions. And this funding is done very collaboratively involving contribution from the high income countries in Europe and from Africa and co-funded by the European Union. So this will continue and really covers neglected tropical diseases as one of the areas. Secondly, we pay special attention to developing the local capacity in terms of developing the people. So there is a comprehensive fellowship scheme that will be continue to run, developing the infrastructure or the clinical research that is funded involves a clinical infrastructure development component and also developing the networking of the individuals, because here we want to develop excellence as well as international collaboration. And all this is developing scientific leadership. But tying it together with the local country, host country involvement, this is where uh, political will from the countries is key to support the additional elements and also the co-investment that will foster sustainability. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Markanga. I think that's a very good way to wrap up this conversation. I think the key words from this I've heard on uh, capacity building, harmonization, integration, coordination, financing, funding, I think all of this will gel well into the goal of eliminating NTDs. So we quickly move to the next um, agenda, which is the official launch or the strategic plan, uh, we have a video for you. So we'd like to invite you to join us for the launch of the DNDI strategic plan 2021-2028. The launch of this new strategic plan is a continuation of the work that DNDI began with its partners about two decades ago to develop and deliver drugs for the most vulnerable communities battling NTDs. So far, they have delivered nine new treatments for people with a sleeping sickness, visceral leishmaniasis, Chagas disease, HIV, and malaria that have saved millions of lives. This strategy charts now the next eight-year journey where DNDI targets to deliver 25 new treatments in their 25 years of existence. There is no better time to launch this plan than, than today as we discuss this critical role of partnerships and commitment by African leaders in innovation and open science for NTDs, something that we've had over the last uh, one hour and 20 minutes. Now join us as we share with you this important event.
It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to DNDI Africa Regional Office to the launch of our strategic plan 2021-2028. As you are already aware, Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, DNDI, is a, an international non-profit organization that discovers, develops, delivers safe, effective, and affordable treatments for the most neglected patients. Our strategic plan charts our eight-year journey from 2021 to 2028, where our main aim is to deliver 25 new treatments for neglected patients in our first 25 years of existence. We need to work extremely hard together with our over 200 partners from more than 40 countries. We need to work with partners from low middle income countries, advocate for change, increase our partners to cover a diverse range of our research and development collaborations. People are dying. And so we need to continue discovering, delivering urgent treatments for neglected patients. DNDI is working uh, on drug candidates for eight deadly diseases, including the following diseases around, found in Africa. Sleeping sickness, leishmaniasis, filaria or river blindness, uh, mycetoma, COVID-19 and pandemic prone diseases, as well as uh, HIV infection. In the last 18 years, DND has delivered nine treatments, saving millions of lives. DNDI in Africa has contributed to this success. Following the consultative process, we have selected three new areas for further investigations. This includes snake bite, dengue fever, and schistosomiasis. We aim to identify eight to 10 new drug candidates by 2028. So to achieve this, we need to advocate for change, public responsibility, and, and public policies that will enable a more effective and equitable research and development system that will deliver innovation and access to treatments for neglected patients. So we thank all of you, the partners, the funders, who have made significant suggestions and contributed to this excellent strategic plan. Now is the time to act, and we in Africa have positioned ourselves to make significant impact and deliver and transform these plans as outlined in our strategic plan to tangible results that will impact on the lives of millions of our people and save lives in the process. As I conclude, I want to remind you of the African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, we go together. So join us and let us walk together so that we can go far. The progress made by DNDI is just enormous. It's unbelievable. I couldn't believe that we would reach this state within such a short span of time. This has all been uh, made easy because of the committed uh, work by the scientists and the member countries. Uh, so that now we have more than 200 uh, institutions uh, participating in uh, the work of DNDI in more than 40 different countries. Very frequently, uh, we have research being carried out in developing countries, but those who benefit are those uh, in the, the so-called developed countries, and the people who have participated in the research have never uh, benefited for many, many years. So this is not going to happen now because of the good work put in by DNDI. And I have great confidence that whatever has been promised in the new strategic plan will be delivered and I wish them best of luck. Thank you very much. So we welcome the support from DNDI and all the stakeholders we see here as we advocate for more resources to reach the people affected by neglected tropical diseases because it's a large swell. Look at the, the north, northern Kenya, look at the coast, lake region, Schistosomiasis, soil transmitted element, but we can manage with the partnership from all these key stakeholders. So as a ministry, we look forward to working together. Thank you very much. I think Kenya is very, very lucky to host the African office 
that drives the agenda for DNDI in the region. And I think there needs to be greater partnerships with the different ministries of health and the governments. And now with the coming in of the African CDC, we look forward to possibly as DNDI to partner much more in the region and to make sure that there's more synergy and more traction and the access program that has been the biggest elephant in the house. You can have the new products, very good drugs, but getting them to those who need them is still a nightmare. And I think that's where the reach is for working with the various ministries of health to have programs that will allow purchase and deliver of these products to those who need them. And also seeing what role the African CDC is going to play outside the pandemic that are, is currently keeping them busy. And I think those are some of the areas that we want to see more traction. And looking for that, more African governments are going to start putting money on the table to co-partner and support and possibly complement the resources that are coming from the north on some of the neglected tropical diseases that we are being addressed by DNDI. With that, I say, together, let's give DNDI the support it needs and the encouragement so that the fatigue doesn't set in, especially from the donor funding that possibly DNDI is. Thank you. If we didn't have DNDI on board, we would really, really suffer uh, from the perils of diseases that have been well controlled in other environments, simply because uh, we don't have the means to be able to reach the most vulnerable with the appropriate treatments. And I take pressure in uh, acknowledging that uh, DNDI, through Professor Wasuna, for a long, long time, has matured to the point that uh, we're able to rely on very innovative treatments, uh, renewed energies towards addressing donors and addressing pharmaceutical companies that need to deliver affordable treatments for the most neglected tropical diseases. Really fantastic job that you people have done. And therefore it gives me great, great pressure to uh, really uh, stand here before uh, these uh, very eminent uh, partners and to say that Camry will work together with DNDI and other partners to be able to deliver on the mandates and to deliver on the mission and vision that is envisaged in this new strategic plan. And with that, I wish DNDI and all our partners that are working together for this achievement all the best for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Were it not for social distancing and COVID-19, we'd all be celebrating. So on behalf of everyone, I'd like to clap and congratulate DNDI on this launch of the strategic plan. And we wish you all the best. We look forward, obviously, to more innovative products to, you know, as Dr. Makanga said, an end-to-end -end thinking from development all the way to the access. And from the panelists that we've seen today, I think all those stakeholders are uh, that are involved from the end to end thinking of ending NTDs have been here and it's good to see that you know DNDI is on the right uh, in, on the right direction. So I'd like to thank DNDI for making this webinar possible. Dr. Monique Wasuna, who is the Director of Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative, the Africa Regional Office, uh, for making this webinar you know, a reality and bringing us all together to discuss innovations for NTDs in the next decade and looking at the critical role of African leadership. And we've been able to have a conversation over the last one and a half hours. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't answer all the questions, but Dr. Asuna, Dr. Karaoke, uh, Dr. Kuria, that is, um, and Gerald have been able to answer some of your questions on the Q&A. Uh, we have some of the questions that were answered live by the panelists, so thank you very much for being a part of this conversation. Our other panelists, uh, from our keynote speaker, Dr. Francis Kuria, who's the acting head of the Directorate of Public Health of the Kenyan Ministry of Health, where LTD falls. Professor Samuel Karaoke, who's the acting director general, Kemri, uh, Dr. Michael Makanga, the Executive Director of the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership. Uh, Gerald Churinda, who's the founder and CEO of Africa 
of Future Africa Investments Limited. And then last but not least was Dr. Sheila Shawa, who's a senior programs officer at the AU Commission in the Department of Social Affairs and AIDS, TB, malaria, and other infectious diseases. We had uh, Dr. Sultani Matedechero, who's the director, National Public Health Institute uh, in Kenya. So thank you very much for everyone who's made this a success. And as I said, earlier, some of the key uh, take home points was on developing local capacity, domestic funding, financing, the involvement of the youth and Dr. Uh, Rinda was able to you know, give us a few areas in which the youth can get involved, this being an era where innovation technology is really ripe, then there is a, a chance for all the youth. The issues of harmonization, not working in silos, integrating uh, entities into health systems, strengthening the health system, increasing um, budgetary allocations to health so that you know NTDs can be eliminated so that you know this becomes a disease of the past so that by 2030 we can look back and say we have gotten somewhere. So thank you very much. My name is Dr. Masi Korir. Uh, it was my pleasure to host you and guide you through this uh, webinar and the launch of DNDI strategic plan. So I'd like to wish you all a good day for those who are morning, a good evening for those who are evening and you know um, Good afternoon for those who are in the afternoon. As we said, this conversation continues. The hashtag is beat NTDs or Africa beats NTDs. Let's continue uh, with this conversation and you can get in touch with the DNDI info Africa at dndi.org and you'll be able to answer any of the questions and some of the questions that were not answered in this webinar. So thank you very much and thank you for your valued time.